Good morning, everyone. My name is Jesse. This is Dave, id. So I want to start off with, oh, hey, Mr. H. So I want to start off with a, a story. And I want to share with you a little bit about, you know, when I come to a church, usually, you know, to help out, that's what I do. That's kind of my thing. I come here twice, and I want you all to know a little bit about me, just a little bit. And uh, back in 2008, I was uh, in a church. I was part of the worship team, and I felt a longing, a calling to be a worship leader. Now, what's the difference between being a part of a worship team and a worship leader? Uh, it's a subtle difference, but I felt it here, that I wanted to be a worship leader. And, uh, but the doors were, were, weren't exactly opening. In fact, they were, they were closing and to the point where I was very, even rarely used on the worship team. And I became discouraged. So uh, in true uh, believer fashion, I said to myself, what I'm going to do is I'm going to enter into a fast. I don't know if you can tell, I don't like fasting. But I, uh, I entered into a fast on 8808. And this was my prayer. Lord, I feel that you want me to be a worship leader. It's not happening, and I need to know if I read you wrong. If this is something that I want for myself versus something that you want for me, you need to let me know. And I asked very specifically, please give me a sign. How many of us have ever asked God for a sign? Yeah. And I, I was like, I need you to be crystal clear on this one uh, because I'm about to give up. At this time, I was supporting my family on the river walk of San Antonio, playing for the tourists and playing, you know, Tom Petty and, and the Eagles and all these good things. And that's how I provided for my fam. And uh, one Friday night of about a week later, I was there at the, in the river walk at a, at, a, at a place called Waxy O'Connor's Irish Pub. It's an Irish pub. And I had my drummer with me. And it wasn't David. <laughs> it wasn't David. But I had my drummer with me. And every once in a while, I would break out into a worship song uh, there in the pub. And he would get so angry with me. He'd be like, no, it's not the place. I'm like, I know. Because he was part of the church, too. So stay with me. Here we go. Ready? This night, it was very empty. There were some people out in the patio. And there was no one in, in, in the room where we were playing. And there was a couple people in the back. But it was totally, totally slow. And again, I was discouraged. So... I said to myself, what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to uplift myself, knowing it was going to anger him. And I started, right? And he sees me, and he's just like, mm. and, I, and, I, and I go, it's, it's, come on. He's like, okay. So this is the song that I used to uplift myself. And this is, imagine this being in a pub, okay? And come along with me. Y'all don't have to stand up on this one if you don't want, but... The story is going to continue in a bit, so just check this out. I use this because worshiping makes me feel better. It makes me connect with God. It reminds me what I'm here for. And remember, I was asking God, am I or am I not supposed to be a worship leader? And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of Perfect love is casting out fear Even when I'm caught in the middle of the storms of this life I won't turn back, I know you are near And I will fear no evil For my God is with me And if my God is shall I fear who then shall I fear oh no never let go through the calm through the storm oh no you never let go in every high every low oh no you never let go Lord you never let go of me and I can see a light
troubles, but until that day comes, I live to know you here on the earth, and I will fear no evil, for my God is with me, and if my God is with me, who then shall I? It's coming for a heart that holds on. There will be an end to these troubles, but until that day comes, still I will praise you. Still I will praise you. Singing, oh no, you never let go through the calm, through the storm. Oh no, you never let go. Every high, every low, oh no, you never let go, Lord, you never let go of me. We're singing, oh no, you never let go through the calm, through the storm, oh no, you never let go. And every high, every low, oh no, you never let go, Lord, you never let go. I finished that song and I felt my being just uplifted this little guy runs in from outside and he stands right in my line of view and he goes "Woo!" <laughs> now naturally I said to myself oh look it's a drunk worshiper how wants it and uh and, and he comes up to me and he goes I cannot believe you're playing that song in an Irish pub and he goes are you a worship leader and I go no I'm not a worship leader I'm kind of like and he stops me and he looks me dead. <sighs> dead in the eyes. And he goes, you are a worship leader. I see the anointing of God all over you. And the little hair on the back of my head just stood up. Because all of a sudden I remembered the prayer. And he goes, do you, do you know the song, Open the Eyes of My Heart? Now, guys, I work for requests where I am. And then I'm like, well, sure, a little. Yeah, open the eyes. And he's like, no, no, no. He's like, I'm not requesting it. I want you to know I wrote it. And I go, what? And he goes, uh, I'm not telling you I wrote it. And I go, your name's Paul Blosh? Uh, Belosh, Blosh. <laughs> and he's like, yeah. He said, I'm not telling you that. Just say, hey, I'm Paul. The reason I'm telling you is because I was where you were. I was supporting my family, doing just what you're doing. And God changed my life. And I want you to know that God is with you. And he has a plan for you and for not to give up. And I got so choked up. And I was like, and uh, the rest of the night, he, uh, he poured encouragement. You know, I, I couldn't just let it go. He, he went out back to his party. His, his, okay, his, his daughter was getting married here in San Antonio. And that's why he was there. And I walked outside, and he poured encouragement. And he just absolutely just built into me in those short bursts of communication that we had. That night, uh, I, I went home, and well, back then we had this little tool called Google. And I Googled him. 
And I started seeing all of the songs that he had written, not just open the eyes of my heart, all of the songs that we were singing in church at that time, it was Paul Balash, all of them. It was before Hillsong, it was before Bethel, before everything that was being played today, it was Paul. He had written so many. And I called my friend, uh, Mr. H, who's actually here, I'm not calling you out, but I called him and I go, Mr. H, you're not gonna believe what happened. Um, and, and I told him, I go about the, the fast and I told him about everything that had gone on and I told him, and, and then Paul Balash shows up, and he, and, he, and, this is what he, and he goes, wait a second. Let me get this straight. He goes, you asked God to send you a sign. And he sent you the most covered worship artist of our time to a pub on the river walk to tell you that you're a worship leader. And I go, yeah, I guess so. And he's just like, well, I guess you're a worship leader. <laughs> And it's like, and a few months later, I got the opportunity that I longed for. So in honor of God hearing my prayer, sending me not just a sign, but the sign of all signs, to say, yeah, you're on the right track. Will you stand with us? Can we put our hands together? You remember from last week? Right there, oh, uh, oh, uh, oh, uh. a drum, boom. Yeah, just like that. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open to see you move in our lives.
Lord, sometimes the signs that you send aren't quite as obvious. But we need to pay more attention to the signs you do send. And we thank you for this moment together. We thank you and we praise you. Amen? Would you turn to someone and just kind of wave or fist bump or whatever it is that we do? Just go, hey, welcome everybody because we're in this together. We are in this together. God is mighty to save, He is mighty to save, forever, author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave, Jesus conquered the grave. you find me, all my fears and failures, Lord, fill my life again, I give my life to follow everything I believe in, now I
sing out for the glory of the risen King. Come on, shout. Oh, oh, shout. Jesus, shout. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Savior, He can move the mountains. Our God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Lord, we're asking you to move mountains. We're asking you to wake us up, to renew our fire. I want to pray for these seats as you do a work here, Lord. Every space, it has a name and you know those names. Prepare us, equip us, that we may reach out in your holy name for your purposes. And that somewhere, someone that needs a sign will hear from you. And I pray this in your name. And all who agree say, Amen. Amen. God is sovereign and God is sustaining. That's what we're learning through the book of Colossians. And so I want to start with a very important question for us. The question is this. What is the difference between Christ and us or Christ in us? Now, which one are you? We'll get back to that question, but first let's just dive in. Let me just read Colossians. We'll go to chapter 1, verses 24 through chapter 2, verse 5. Let's just roll with it. This is Paul writing. Remember Paul from prison writing to the church in Colossae, a church that he's never been to, uh, but he has a heart for, and he wants them to make sure that they get this right. He says, Now I rejoice in my suffering for you that I am completing in my flesh what is lacking in Christ's affliction for his body, that is, the church. I have become its servant according to God's commission that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known the mysteries hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. God wanted to make known among the Gentiles the glorious wealth of this mystery, which is Christ in you. Emphasis on purpose. The hope of glory. So we proclaim him warning and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. I labor for this, striving with his strength, that works powerfully in me. For I want you to know how greatly I am struggling for you, and for those in Laodicea, and for all who have not yet seen me in person. I want their hearts to be encouraged and joined together in love so that they may have all the riches of complete understanding and have the knowledge of God's mystery, Christ. In Him are hidden the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I'm saying this so that no one will deceive you with arguments and that sound, reason, that sound reasonable. For I may be absent in body, but I'm with you in spirit, rejoicing to see how well ordered you are and the strength of your faith in Christ. So that's God's word, and we're going to dig into this. And like I said, this question for us is important in this, to ask, what's the difference between Christ and us or Christ in us? And if it seems like just a matter of semantics at first, go so much deeper than that. Are you just and Christ, or are you in Christ? Is Christ in you? Now, kind of, to put up little layers of understanding on it, you know, if you were in a band, would you want to be in a band that, you know, were you just one of the ands? 
If you were Gladys Knight, and who, who was with Gladys? The Pips. And the Pips were, I don't know what a Pip is, I don't want to be a Pip, but the Pips were interchangeable, you see? Like it started with one group of Pips, um, and I think it's interesting, the one in the middle there, that's Gladys' brother. Like how would you like to be the guy, Gladys' brother? I'm just a Pip. And look at the picture, he's like, hey brother, get, low, get a little l- lower, 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 lower. So like, sit at my feet, brother, I am Gladys Knight. You are a Pip. And the Pips were interchangeable. So like, and, the and is not necessarily what we're aiming for. So it, you know, take it to Sunny and who? Did anybody watch the Betty White special and like Cher sang at the end, thank you for being a friend? That's when we turned it off. Go, no Cher, do not ruin the Golden Girls theme song. Um, but yeah, Sunny and Cher, like they had their own show, they had their own albums, and they were married, and then they weren't. Then they went their own ways, because if you're just and, you know, it can be disposable. Speaking of disposable, um, man, here's a, yeah, I want to see, see who the heathens are in the, in the church today. Um, no, I grew up, yeah, I grew up, yeah, yeah, okay, thanks, Beth, 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 proudly raise her hand. No, 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 so here's all, guns, letter N roses, you know, not just and or ampersand, A-N-D, and, like, they've, like, let's just go in. No, they're still not in, you know, because it goes, oh, Axel Rose, anybody, you know, fun and trivia, uh, y'all know, y'all know Axel's real name? Dude, I knew Jesse would get that. Yeah, William, <laughs> William Bruce Rose. Yeah, Axel sounds tougher. Let's just make it Axel. Apparently one of the hardest men in, in music to work with. So Guns N' Roses has had all of these the difficulties where those band members have, have changed and been interchangeable over time. Because it's like, you know, it's just my way and it's your way. And if our ways don't go together, well, then away with you. Guns N' Roses, Guns and Axel Rose, William Bruce Rose. There's difficulty there. So you see what I'm saying? It's not just semantics, but and is kind of conditional. If it's just you and me, and we're not getting along so well, well, let's just go our own ways. It's hard to do if you're, if you're in, if you're in. So speaking about Christ and, if it's Christ and us, I put a little logo up there that used to be the logo of like every church, youth group, and children's ministry was called Jam. Are you going to Wednesday night Jam? Get your jam on on Wednesday nights. Jam stood for Jesus and me. <laughs> and I remember I, I was part of a youth group. Where we, had, we had Wednesday night jam, and when God called me to be a youth pastor, I inherited a Wednesday night program, and guess what it was called? And it had the logo, Jesus and me. And I thought, it's just so cringy. Just because it was cringy because it was cringy. But then if I thought, like, theologically, it's not so accurate, especially if we look at the scriptures that talk about Christ in us and us in Christ. So it's not Jesus and me, because if, if it's Jesus and me, when the going gets tough, and you gone. Or when I didn't sign up for this, and you gone. <laughs> when you find a more attractive and, I want to attach my and to that and, and then you whatever looks more attractive, you just keep following the next best thing. The grass greener on the other and, and then you gone. Or when you just get bored. Some of us are incredibly allergic to boredom, David Bruns. Um, I'm saying, because we're, we're like that way. If we're bored, we're gone. So if it's just Jesus and me, and I find Jesus or church boring, man, I'm gone. And then Jesus would speak to something about this, right? John chapter 15, verse 5 says, Apart from me, you can do what? Nothing, no thing. Jesus saying, if it's just Jesus and you, and we're really just kind of, we're not together, we're just kind of going parallel for a while, you're not in me. You're not a part of me. You're not abiding in me. Then you can do no thing, nothing. So let's change it over to Jesus, Jesus in us. When we have Christ in us. It's like this beautiful picture we see at some wedding ceremonies. Maybe you had it at your wedding ceremony or, or your, your kid or your niece. You saw this thing where they had two separate containers of sand and each container representing each one of the, the bride and the groom's lives and their families and all that they have been and all that they will be. And they pour those, those, those containers of sand into one container. And the picture there is of, of just like you can't separate those, those grains of sand back out into their containers. I mean, I know some of you guys are like, Scientifically, I might have gone, well, literally, I guess you could take a pair of tweezers and you could spend, you know, decades separating the sands. Missing the picture. 
Those sands are so ingrained together that they cannot be separated. They are in. They're all in. And since Jesus is, is sovereign, he's all-powerful, all-knowing, omnipresent, and since he's sustaining, he's loving and holding us, wouldn't you rather be in Christ than and Christ? Because Christ is all in. He didn't, he didn't say, hey, I'm going to go this far, and that's, I've, I, there's a limit. I don't want to cross that line, God. God, your will be done as long as it doesn't take me there. And Christ even crawled out to God, making sure that this was really all, he had to be all in. Remember, from the garden, he's crying out, Father, if there's any other way that we can redeem and rescue mankind, if there's any other way that, that we can offer salvation to those that have gone away, which is all of us, each and every one of us gone astray, Jesus saying, is there any other way? And you would expect heaven to reply with a big, booming voice. But in the absence of the answer was the answer. The Christ, your will be done and not mine. Christ went to the cross for us, provided salvation for us. So he was all in. Are you? So let's break this down, this, this, this section of scriptures we read. Let's kind of take it, you know, section by section for a while. Paul, remember, from prison is saying, now I rejoice in my sufferings for you. We're going to get to the sufferings for you in a second. But first, at first reading of this, you might go, hey, what's that? I have a question about I am completing in my flesh what is lacking in Christ's afflictions? Question mark. So it might sound like, wait, 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 was something absent from Christ's work on the cross? Was there something that still needed to be completed in that? So that's a question, and I said, I've got a book called Hard Sayings of the Bible, and in the book of Colossians, there's only two entries in this book, because most of Colossians is just straightforward. Paul's writing a short book, a short letter, just getting to the power-packed point of the gospel, and so there's not a lot of questionable things, or, or like, ah, I'm kind of confused, but this is one of them. Because at first reading, you go, wait, 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 is there something lacking in Christ's work? Well, we have to look a little bit at, well, who's, who's the lacking part attached to? Is the lacking connected to, like, Paul's flesh? He talks about my flesh. I'm completing in my flesh what's lacking in Christ's afflictions. So we have to look, is the lacking on Paul's part or Christ's part? And there's nothing else in any other, other Paul's writings where he would say Christ was lacking, so we had to finish the job. So, Remember, use Scripture to interpret Scripture. So we see that, that that's not what it's going to be. It's going to be Paul recognizing, I'm still working this out. I'm still giving all I can, and I'm still lacking because I haven't reached how Christ suffered and afflicted. And so it's an important thing to look at the, at the Greek here also, if we're going to see, is this Christ's affliction like suffering on the cross, or his just suffering in general? Because he suffered for the church, right? He would, he would pour out in tears because weeping over Jerusalem like a, a you know, sheep without a shepherd. Christ was continually afflicted. And so there's a cool uh, nuance here in the Greek, if you'll let me be word nerd just for a second for us. Because some of you like the word nerd stuff too. So the word we get here for afflictions is thalipsis. Thalipsis is, is like suffering, but it's not the suffering of talking of Christ and his cross, the passion. That's a different word. Whenever we read of the redemptive suffering of Christ, that word is, is pasco. Pasco is where we get the word passion. So Paul's not using the word passion here. He's just using the word affliction. So before we get too just confused on this, just know the lacking part is on Paul's part. Paul is still suffering for the church, not trying to fulfill anything that Christ left undone. Is that clear? So you kind of use those, the scripture to interpret scriptures and then to get to, go. Okay, now I've got a foundation. Now I can get to the part where Paul really wants us to get the point is Christ in us. And if Christ is in us, then we are growing in Christ. And so he talks about there's a suffering component of that. And he's rejoicing in his suffering. Not a big fan of pain, but some pain is necessary. And especially for others. Like, we have all been burdened for others. Like, maybe there's a, a wayward uh, family member, a wayward loved one, and they're making poor choices, um, or they're on a self-destructive path, and, and we don't just have pity for them. We have a compassion for them. It hurts deep within us, like in our bowels. I'm like, I hurt for them. Paul's got that same thing. He says, my suffering for 
you. Remember, he's writing this from prison. Remember, Paul was no stranger to suffering. This is a guy that took the 39 lashes on several occasions, been shipwrecked, been beaten, been stoned, been left, been abandoned. He knows what suffering is, and he's suffering. So my suffering is for you. And so like when we give and for others, it might take something from us, but in the end it feels good because we recognize we're doing it for others because that's in the footsteps of our Savior Jesus Christ, suffered for others. So when we're in Christ, we can't just stay in our own little bubble. It's just Jesus and me, jam, and that's all I need. No, Christ calls us, commands us even like, go, go, and as you suffer, I'm with you. So Christ and us, if it's just Christ and us, when the suffering comes, we say, see ya, things got hard, here's the struggle. If it's just Jesus and me going, hey, Jesus, you keep struggling. I'm going to go over here and comfort for a while. I'll come back later when it's comfortable again, when the coast is clear. But when suffering comes, see ya. Jesus tells a parable about this, right? A plant that's, that's, that's rooted down in like rocky soil. So when the sun scorches, it just withers away. That's Jesus and me. But if we're Jesus in and us in, well, it's all in, even in the suffering. A book that, that kind of described this, and it's a book I never thought I'd uh, quote, and I'm not necessarily recommending the book. It's not a Christian book. Uh, it's a book by an endurance athlete who says this, distance and abstinence are the only ways that you can truly guarantee your own safety. It's from a book called Burn Your Couch. Yeah, but like you kind of get the point. Go ahead, burn your couch and just get moving all the time. And so this person is trying to get to the point of recognizing if you want just safety, if you want no suffering, well, just disconnect yourself from all attachments. You know, distance yourself from anyone that might cause you suffering. And then just abstain from everything. Just abstain from everything. And then you might guarantee your own safety. But is that life? It's definitely not a Christian life that we've been called to. But we would attempt to do this with, with God. God, I want to keep you at arm's distance. This is, this is and. <laughs> God, if I can keep you at a distance where Heisman's stiff-arming him, going to God, don't get too close because then you might go to meddling and the meddling might cause me to suffer. Or just abstain from everything. I'm not going to church. I'm not reading the Word. I'm not serving others. I'm not going to serve the poor. I'm not going to give blood. I'm not going to make a casserole. I'm not doing nothing. I abstain from all the good and the bad. And then you just find yourself in your own little cocoon where you will just slowly rot and die in the grave that you created for yourself. So, in being in Christ will involve suffering. Jesus said it himself. In this world you will have troubles, but take heart, I am with you. So don't get on the and wagon. I <laughs> see what I did there. Don't get on the and wagon where I'm just going to keep God at a distance, but we get in Christ. If Christ is in you and you were in Christ, well, here's the goal. We keep reading. Colossians chapter 1, verse 25 and 26. I have become its servant according to God's commission that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for all ages and generations, but now revealed in his saints. If you can remember from weeks past, remember Paul is writing to the Colossian, uh, Colossian heresy, which was that there's this other knowledge out there. You, and you need to find the secret hidden mysteries so that you could, you could know more and always also be searching. Like you could find more, but then also be on a, a, a path of always, always searching. Like I still haven't found what I'm searching for. I still haven't found what I'm looking for. Bono from the band U2 would write. And he says this about that song. He says, in, in the music business, it's always cool to be searching. And it's not so cool when you find you know, because as long as you're on a journey, as long as you're searching, you're kind of cool. You're on a quest, a truth quest, a mystery quest. But when we find that mystery is made known to us, it's what Paul is saying here. So he's, conflict, he's con kind of conflicting and inviting the Gnostics who are on the truth quest of mystery for mystery's sake. So, you know, here's the mystery. We found it. We got to the end. And here's the truth. Here's what it is. It's Christ in you. Christ in you is something we get to see that even like, think of all of the saints of the Old Testament. Think of Moses, David, Deborah, all of these people. They didn't get to see this part of the mystery. They didn't get to see Christ 
in us. They didn't experience the Christ in you that we see when we read in verse 27. That God wanted to make known among the Gentiles, that's us, we all get included in this thing now, the glorious wealth of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Since I'm watching the Olympics a little bit, anybody else watching the Olympics a little bit on TV? Um, it's a skeleton luge compared to a bobsled. Christ and you, and you, it's like, hey, everybody just go down the, go down the, go down the, what do you call the thing, the, the track. Go down the icy track at 90 miles an hour. Just go down one at a time. That's the skeleton luge. This is guy going head first on a little bitty, you know, a little bitty sled. Just go head first. It's just you, and if you crash, it's just you. That's and. <laughs> Versus, and we're in this thing together. Feel the rhythm, feel the rhyme. Come on, y'all, it's bobsled time. Cool runnings. It's a great movie. Yeah, cool runnings. They're all in this thing together. If we go down, we go down together. <laughs> we're in this thing. So this is the Christ in us. And so when Christ is in us and we're in Christ, there's some identifying characteristics. If we're in Christ, we're in prayer. If we are in Christ, we are in the Word. If we are in Christ, we are in community. And you're going, really, another sermon where it's just like the application is to pray and read the Bible. Yes. It's not rocket surgery. God made it so simple that, so that anyone could do it, that we could be a people of prayer, a people of the word, a people of community, and we are united in that together, recognize that if we are in Christ, like you're in Christ and I'm in Christ, we have that thing in common, the Holy Spirit in both of us, connecting us, we are in Christ together. And so we go down, we go down together. When we celebrate, we celebrate together. Uh, a a friend of mine in his church just, they, they were able to buy a bingo hall and make church now happen in a former bingo hall. I was like, dude, I celebrate that with you. Even though I'm not a part as a member of your church body local, I'm a part of the church universal. I'm like, that's a win for all of us. Wow. You get to, you get to be a ministering church in that, that neighborhood, that part of town. Like, that's a win for all of us. And in the same way, when we struggle, we struggle together. There's identifying the identifying of I'm in this, in prayer, in the word, in community. See if I can make an analogy short. Doubt it. Um, <laughs> so, so I put on my Irish sweater today in, in honor of Jesse singing at an Irish bar, Irish pub, Wax Joe Connors. Um, <laughs> no, my, my mom-in-law went to Ireland and she came and she got us all these big bulky Irish sweaters. I'm already starting to sweat. Um, and, and part of it, you know when they, when they would sew all of these intricate designs in the sweaters? Like, the, the wives of the Irish fishermen, that she would, she would weave all of these little intricate, like, you know, um, designs, and each one was like a prayer. She's weaving these prayers into his, into his sweater, so that as he goes out on the, the raging seas, if the prayers worked, he'd come back alive. And if he didn't come back alive, um, because fish don't eat wool, you could identify the body. There's a happy story for Sunday morning. But I believe, I believe that when we're in Christ, like we're in prayer, we're in the word, we're in community of his church, like these are the identifying marks on us. So whether we get beat up in this world or not, I think get chaotic, when we wash up on the other shore, the angels might be looking down on us and going, man, I, what's this? I'm not even sure it's human. <laughs> and Jesus will look down on us and go, well, you see that sweater he's got on? We're together. They are in me, and I am in them. And this is the hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. So I'm thinking of the, a tale of two deathbeds. As, as I get to be called into ministry, and I get called often to these moments where, where someone's about to pass. We're going to have prayer together. We're going to lift up encouragement for the family together. So I've been at that bedside of, of many people that are just about to, to pass on. 
And for those who have Christ in them and they are in Christ, there is the hope of glory. So many times that, that, that a person will be relatively non-responsive. But when we pray and you feel like they can squeeze your hand back or you see the eye movement behind eyelids and you'll, they're connected, there's a hope. They know of the hope of glory. It's not just a wish. It's not just I hope so. It's like I know Christ in me and I'm about to see him face to face and there's a, there's a, a hardness there because we hurt because we have loved ones and we're going to miss them, but there's also this incredible hope of glory. So to be at that bedside is something absolutely beautiful. I think about my wife and I uh, getting to pray with Marilyn Huff, someone who had been a part of this church uh, for decades and decades, faithful teacher in the Word, and, and she passed away as my wife was praying for her. In that moment, that's like hope of glory. That's one bedside. There's another bedside I got called uh, by a family I didn't know, but they needed a pastor, so I, you know, I just responded and I went to see them. Uh, I won't say which gang they were affiliated with, but just by the, the, the neck tattoos, I'm going, oh, um, this is a scary, this is a scary bunch of people. And they almost wouldn't even let me in the room to see this kind of, this the patriarch of, of, of this gang uh, who was passing away. And, and all of the sons and the, and the kind of hierarchy of, of, of people in the gang um, didn't know who I was. Here just comes this guy, and I've got my Bible, and I'm ready to go pray. And they wouldn't let me in at first. And then finally, somebody broke through and said, you know, he wants him to come in. So I came in, and I, and I prayed with a man who I always, I always want to speak about especially if I don't know anyone, I just go to this first scripture that comes to mind, which is usually um, from Romans chapter 8, that says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are, you know the Bible, thank you, <laughs> in Christ, in Christ. And so I asked this man, according to this verse, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Are you in Christ? Are you set free from that condemnation? And he said, with some of his last breaths, I sure hope so. And it was a bone-chilling hope so, because it was a wish. It's like he didn't know, and he was trying to leverage in his mind, going, did I do enough good to outweigh enough bad? You see, in that moment, he was hoping on his own. I was with Jesus, kind of, and sometimes, and I called you here to my bedside at my last, you know, my last hours. Is that enough? It was a I hope so. He didn't know the hope of glory. And as that man passed away and I left that room, it was an utter, absolute chaos. It was so bone-chilling, scary to me of, this is what a life with, apart from Christ looks like. And all of the people that he poured his life into, his gang, they immediately began to fight with each other. And this is not the hope of glory. They are not in Christ. They're just in competition with each other. And that's the best you can hope for if you're apart from Christ. And so since we know the truth and since... We have this hope in glory. Read on to how it finishes. That we proclaim Him, warning and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. I labor for this, striving with His strength that works powerfully in me. We'll pray in a moment and we'll get to sing some more, but I wanted this, this words to ring out in us as we are in Christ. We're laboring for this. Christ has done all the work on the cross, and he invites us into the work. So we labor in this, striving. Anybody weary from the striving lately? Look at the next words. We're striving with what? His strength. So glad it's his strength, because mine is so fickle. My strength fails me. Yours does too. Collectively as a church, our strength fails us. But with him, in him, we get his strength, and that strength works powerfully in me. What a beautiful, beautiful reminder as we walk in that, that his power in us. Because he's all sovereign. He's, he's all powerful, all knowing, all present. He didn't have to be in us, but because he loves us, that strength powerfully working in us. Let's pray. Father, let us proclaim your truth again and again to ourselves, 
when we need to hear it. And in the world that needs to know you so deeply and desperately, Father, because you are in us and we are in you, shine light on the hope of all glory. For someone that's maybe been confused and, and, and tricked themselves into believing that they are, are, are in you, but really they're just and you. They've added it as an add-on. Stir in hearts conviction, your Holy Spirit conviction right now. That and would become in. Be in the fellowship. Your spirit alive and at work. Because it's your power and your strength for your glory, for your church. And in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. So we take some time and we respond and we reflect and we sing together. As God's illuminated his word, let's find what's he calling us to do. Let's pray and let's sing. A thousand times I've failed, still your mercy remains. Should I still love you? I'm caught in your grace, everlasting. Your light will shine when all else fades, never end. Your glory goes beyond all fame. My heart and my soul, I give you control. Consume me from the end. Inside out, Lord, let justice and praise become my embrace to love you from the inside out.
cries out from the inside. Lord, my soul cries out. Go and take the and option out of there because there's really no option at all because it leads to death. But if we're in Christ, as life and life eternal. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that you give life. You bring freedom. So in you we are free. Free indeed. We are in you. So let's begin to get ready to, to walk into what you've prepared for the rest of this day. I pray that your light in us would be so abundant that we'd speak life into those who we're walking in darkness. And we would be the sign that someone is praying for right now, that we'd be encouraging. We love one another, encourage one another. Through your powerful, powerful name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Just a few announcements before we go. Can I share just a little bit what's kind of coming up, what's going on?